Up next is Ilya. Um, I'm not going to pronounce his last name, so I'll do it wrong. Uh, Ilya is a post rank. I've known him for a while now, since 8RSS was being conceived. And Three or four years, yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, and who here knows actually what post rank or 8RSS is? Got a few. They're just down in Allen Square. He runs a death house last Monday. Yep, every last Monday of the month we have a dev house event, which is really, it's not a get together in the bar type of thing. It's more of we're developers, we have a projector, and we have three hours, so come and demo stuff. If you want to talk geek, that's the place to go. That's right. <laughs> like if you have any code that you think is awesome, right. they'll get excited. We it's talked about barcode scanners, oh yeah, hardware right. devices. And there's pizza. And there's pizza. Yeah. Yes. And foosball. And foosball. So it's, it's a good time. So. Anyway, Ilya is really involved in the community. He's one of our, uh, our great startup entrepreneurs in town, I think, and doing web stuff. Great that Ilya is here to speak to you guys. And so. it over to him. All right. Thanks, Jesse. So um, as, as Jesse mentioned, so I'm with PostRank. I'm the, uh, the founder of the company. But this presentation is not going to be so much about PostRank as much as uh, when I initially talked to Jesse and kind of trying to think about what it is that I wanted to cover here. Um, Jesse brought up the concept of just build it, which at the time I couldn't quite figure out what that meant to me. So I did some thinking and I was, I was thinking I could talk about some of the things that I found interesting, just looking at other entrepreneurs about my own experience and how I got into it. Be because quite frankly, I've never really taken kind of a, a look at my own history just to see how it is that I ended up at PostRank. And just yesterday when I was going through the slides or making the slides, it, some interesting patterns emerged, I, something I'd never actually given thought to. It's a lot of stuff I've been doing unconsciously. But I think um, hopefully you guys will pick up something interesting from there as well. So how did I get started with technology? I, wasn't, I actually wasn't a technology guy. Lots and lots of uh, heavy geeks that you talk to, you know, you'll start with, so I did Commodore 64 on a two-bit risk with you know, one bit of memory or something like that. Totally not, <laughs> totally not my case. <laughs> Right, it's, I, I did not care about technology at all. I, I loved playing with technology in the sense of I loved playing games. I liked the internet. I browsed it. I played on lots of online games. And, and namely, at the time, it was Microsoft Chess and Checkers. I loved that kind of thing. But it never really occurred to me that that's something that I would be interested in. Until one day, one of my um, friends in high school came in and put up his website, Angelfire website, on the, on the board. And I went, a web page what? And how come you have a web page and I don't have a web page, right? Because I'm a competitive guy. So you're, he was the first one to have a web page in our school. So I was like, well, damn. Like I, I, you know, he wasn't my, my good friend. So I got to figure this out. So he was really into basic uh, programming. He did all kinds of funky stuff. I did not care for that stuff at all. Like it just, it just did not interest me at all. But I said, well, you know, this angel fire thing, I'm going to try it. I'm going to sign up. So I spent a couple of hours just poking around the website and created an account. And somewhere in the process, I'm assuming that everybody here is basically familiar with HTML. Yes? You could probably piece together a Hello World type page in, in no time flat. So I had no knowledge of HTML. But somehow, just through kind of looking at stuff, I realized that you could put stuff inside of tags. And that's how HTML kind of worked. So my Hello World app was literally that. Um, I think I actually put my name in there. But I did not know what I wanted to do. I did not know that the P tag was a paragraph or anything like that. But I just figured, hey, I want to center something on the page. So like, if I put a center tag and I can close it, maybe it'll actually do something. So I did that. I pressed Enter. I, I previewed the page. And all of a sudden, there was my name in the middle of the page. And that was the biggest aha moment in my life, I think. Uh, that's what got me into programming. I, I often wondered what would have happened if that center tag didn't work. What if I tried type, typing in something different, right? What if it was like italics and it didn't work? I, I have no idea because I probably would just said, OK, forget it. This thing sucks. I'm going to move on and continue playing my games. Instead, I really got heavy into the web development world. So I started doing really silly stuff. At the time, I had no conception or no knowledge of how does bitmaps or GIF files, what are those for, right? So the first thing I wanted to do was put up a picture on my site. So I said, OK, I'm going to draw something. So I opened up uh, Microsoft Paint, and I painted a freaking picture. 
And then I said, well, now I want to upload it to my website. The problem was, if you ever worked with Paint, it's a multi-megabyte file. And at the time, AngelFire allowed like 200 kilobytes per account. So I just had to open 15 accounts, and then I uploaded my image and pieces, and then I put up this page. And then my friends went to the site, and they would take you know, 10 minutes to load my 3 megabyte Hello World picture. <laughs> But that's what really got, in, uh, got me interested in this kind of stuff. And then it, it all kind of snowballed from here. Um, in the process, I met a lot of interesting people. And one of the things that I'm personally very interested in is how people get started down this path, right? Because you look at any given company or any given founder, and you wonder, like take Amazon. How is it that Jeff Bezos had that insight? How did he come about building this company? What was that moment of insight? What about PayPal and Max Levchin? What was it about, when, how did it come to be, right, from start to finish? Um, Starbucks, how did Starbucks get started? Um, an amazing book is Founders at Work, right? I, I recommend that all of you guys read it. In fact, you should read all of these books. And I keep reading these books on and on. There's hundreds and hundreds of these. Um, maybe five years or so ago, I set a goal for myself to read a book a week. And I'm happy to say that I'm still keeping up with that, even though sometimes it's, it's really tough. And I, I like to read about businesses, how they get started, what motivates people, and all that kind of stuff. Perfect Scent is a book I read recently, which is completely, totally out of my field. It is actually about a perfume industry, right? It talks about what does it take to make a perfume. And that book blew my mind. It has nothing to do with technology or how to build a website or how to build a business, but it was so completely out of the left field from my own experiences that I found it fascinating. I couldn't pry myself away from that book until I finished it. So I would encourage all of you to um, go on Amazon and start looking at these books. Founders at Work is a, f a great book to start. Also, I got into PostRank. I started PostRank. We did get um, angel and VC uh, financing, all that kind of stuff. I did not have an MBA. I did not have an official business plan. But you know what? I think I actually got an MBA in a box by just filling up my iPod with tons and tons of interviews with founders. You go to something like the Stanford eCorner. There are hundreds of videos and podcasts of all of the most well-recognized entrepreneurs talking about their story. And you get to hear it right from them. How did they come about? What did they do? What are the things they did right? What are the things they did wrong? And the wrong part is actually the most interesting part. Um, likewise, I Innovate, a great uh, podcast for this kind of stuff. Harvard, uh, Harvard Business School, IdeaCast, Audible.com, right? I spent, Audible.com is for audiobooks. They were recently bought by Amazon. I've spent way too much money on Audible. It's, it's my second biggest expense after food on my bill. So I would encourage you guys to look at this stuff because you can get a business education by just listening to these people. So reflecting on that, what's, uh, I want to talk about my own story and how I got, um, how I got to PulseRank. Because I wanted to try and figure out like, what are the few things that I wish I knew when I was starting with PulseRank, right? If I could give you some advice. And then as I was going through the slides, I realized that there was no one single thing. It was really kind of a series of events that led me to PulseRank. So I want to go through my history a little bit and some of the things that I've learned. So as I said, I started with creating a website, right? So um, paint was my first endeavor into graphics. Uh, very quickly, I realized that I wanted to make pretty graphics. So I really got into Photoshop. I, at the time, there was not a lot of resources online. So I said, OK, let me learn Photoshop. Let me find all the tutorials I could find. Uh, let me try and build a pretty website. That evolved into a. Uh, design company, essentially, where I built a lot of uh, local restaurants and all that kind of thing. I evolved into a hosting company. I ended up doing some security consulting. I ended up start starting a big community site. I built some hardware projects that failed. So all of these things, and there's more. So I want to go into some of the specifics. So the first thing was the, uh, what I call the graphics world. There was no good resources for online tutorials. I scoured the internet, and I found like 100 sites, 100 tutorials for Photoshop. So I said, hey, this sucks. I'm going to build a destination site for other people that want to learn Photoshop. So I built graphicsworld.com. And at the time, it was the biggest aggregator of Photoshop-related tutorials. And in the process, as I was learning this stuff, I said, well, I could actually make this a business. 
right? And the beautiful thing about the internet is nobody knows you're 14, right? So I, I actually pitched clients. Um, I found, I tried to pitch them as in walk into the door and say, hey, I want to build a website for you. Of course, being 14 years old gives you, makes some challenging uh, sales pitches, right? So I did a few, and then I started sending emails saying, here's my portfolio, here's the work I've done. Look at this, I could do something for you. And then they would say, that's great, that's fascinating, let's figure this out. And then I walk in into the door and they would like, whoa, hold on, you're 14 years old, you're really gonna do my website kind of thing. And you know what, that worked well. So the first thing that um, I realized was by working with uh, a lot of people is oftentimes it's not the design, right? It is helping people understand what they want in the first place. Because lots of business owners is, are, are gonna come and uh, tell you that I just want a website, I want a contact page, I want this. What you're really there for is to try and help them understand what is the actual point of the website. If you're a restaurant, really it's the menu, right? Or is it? Or if you're selling hardware, maybe it's the white papers or all of that kind of work. So it, it, that was an eye-opening moment for me where I realized that it's not about the actual design, it's about helping people understand what they want out of their own business. As I was doing the websites, I, I probably had 50 or 60 clients at the end of it. I ended up opening up a whole lot of uh, shared hosting accounts. So every site I would uh, create, I would put on a shared hosting account and I would pay it you know, $5.95 and I would charge the, the actual business owner maybe $7 just to kind of buffer that extra cost. Then I realized that, hey, this um, dedicated hosting market, which is heating up right now, the prices are falling very quickly. So let me just take a step back. Uh, maybe I can buy my own server, consolidate all of that, and make a lot more money. So I bought my first uh, server, and I had no knowledge whatsoever about administering a server, right? I got a, a shell into a Linux machine, and I said, I have no idea. But this is gonna be awesome, because I can save money. So for the next 12 months, I started learning Linux. And um, how do you set up an Apache web server? What's a name server? I couldn't tell you any of what any of those things did, but I had them running somehow, right? And thank you for the, uh, all the message boards and the support forums and all the people that helped me along the way to help me understand that. One of the things I learned was I never advertised my hosting. I, I launched this thing, I called it FortiHost. It was FortiHost.com. I never advertised, so I'm not saying uh, like Ali, don't do marketing, but I never advertised in the sense that I never went out and bought ads. I had 100 clients, I migrated them to Ford Host, and then an amazing thing started happening. They started referring other people, and I didn't have to do a thing. And this, this became a recurring theme in all of my businesses later, or all of my endeavors later. Word of mouth is the best way to sell, right? If you have happy customers, they're willing to refer um, other people. And you have to go above and beyond, just like Ali said with handwritten notes. In my case, it was oftentimes when you buy a shared hosting account, you get some space on, on the server. That's great. But I was going beyond. When somebody uh, called me and said, hey, my forum is not performing well, could you take a look at that? I said, sure, yeah, why not? I'm, I'm curious. I want to learn about it. So I would go in and actually do custom software development work for them. And at the end of the day, it was probably a loss on my part, but I was curious. I wanted to know how it worked. So I learned a lot through that process, and the word of mouth was key to uh, growing this. Through just pure word of mouth, the, the business actually grew. It was never meant to be a business. It was more of a, okay, I'm just going to do this to save some money on the side. But it actually be, uh, got to a point where I said, you know, that makes absolutely no sense for me to do custom design work. I could just focus on this because it's much more scalable. And that was my first experience with kind of custom consulting. Cust consulting doesn't scale. It can pay really well, but it doesn't scale because you have to be up, you have to be doing stuff, you have to be interfacing with clients. It, it's all great. But if I could have a business where it paid while I slept, that's the best thing, right? And that was my key insight from running this thing where I said, once I set up the server, once it was secure and once, once it was running, I didn't have to do a thing. And it was actually quite nice to wake up on a Thursday morning and realize that he had three new signups overnight. I didn't, I didn't have to do a thing, right? That's a good way to start the morning. Um, so moving on from there, then I should add, all of this is happening while I was in school. So I'm actually a computer science grad from 
UW. So oftentimes, school took second place. And, you know, it's a, I had to balance it, but um, it worked out really well in the sense that oftentimes I actually found my classes a lot more interesting because, for example, from doing custom administration work, running my own servers, I understood some of the problems. So when, so when the uh, prof talked about a B tree and how it relates to databases, I could say, yeah, I just did a custom script because, you know, for that client because he was having a problem with the database because he had that type of query. And I would ask very pointed questions. So like, theoretically, if I had a table of this size and you know, with these parameters and I ran this type of query, would the B tree fail? And he'd be like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> right? And that, that was really good. So it was often the case that I found some classes very boring and it just they did not appeal to me. And then some classes were just, I would completely swallow because they related directly to what I was doing at the time. Uh, the next thing that happened um, was I ended up doing quite a bit of uh, security work. So running a couple of hundred websites, I got hacked a number of times. And, and oftentimes, those were not deliberate attacks. They were oftentimes just you know, some script kitty uh, scans the entire network and attacks your servers, and all of a sudden, your servers are compromised. So I had to learn quite a bit about network security, how do you harden your servers, doing all that kind of work. And after doing five, of, five or six of these uh, recoveries, I realized that I could actually make a quite nice living on this because this was a recurring theme. Once I got the right uh, tools in place, I realized that these attacks were happening all the time. So one of the summers for my co-op term, I said, hey, I, I have a, a nice opportunity here. In fact, I know a lot of people that could use my services. Um, specifically at the time, I was um, quite into uh, Quake 2. I, I like to play the game. And lots and lots of, because the cost of uh, dedicated servers was coming down, uh, players were actually buying servers and putting them, up on, uh, putting them up online. Oftentimes it would be $80 to keep your server or to get a server, which is not that expensive, right? The problem was they, none of them knew anything about administering the server or keeping it secure. So my service was, I could come in and secure the server or restore a service after it was attacked. And this was actually a beautiful business model because this is what happens. A gamer gets a dedicated server. He's really excited about it. And by a gamer, I usually mean somebody like 15, 16 years old. So they're using their uh, mom and dad's credit card. Mm -hmm. They're all hyped up about it. They bring up the server. They get all of their friends onto it. And then they start talking trash. And then one of the guys in that game says, you know what, I can just run the script against your server and like bring it down because it was all about, you know, one, I have a better ping time or I'm going to attack you and I have a better server here. So there was just distributed attacks going all over the place. And there's no better time to charge people than when their servers are on fire. Right? When, you need, when, when the server is compromised or when the data is about to get lost, I was there to help. Right? So I was right in, uh, right in that game. I was, I was playing the game, I knew the people, and I made quite a nice living out of it for a little while. So that was my co-op term. I, that was the idea for my co-op term. I started doing that, I did it for two months, and then I realized that while I was making great money, it sucked. It, it drove me nuts. I, I couldn't stand it in the sense that the 3 a.m. calls were not uh, good for my health, I guess. Um, and I couldn't see myself doing it on and on while it was paying well. So I said, after two months, this is about mid-July, I said, you know what, that's it, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just going to continue doing Fortihos. So I, I closed down the uh, consulting service and actually went to a backpacking trip to, uh, to Europe. I took the money that I made and went traveling. And that was, that was, that was fantastic. So that was my experiment uh, with that. Yeah, so once again, reinforcing that consulting is not scalable. It pays well. But passive worked better. So then the next thing happened. So my next co-op term, I, I went through school. That was actually a, a kind of a quiet year. I just did four to host in the background. Uh, for the next thing, I, uh, I got a car, right? And it's a new shiny car. So I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to get into that community. So I joined this forum called Mazda6Club.com. And there was about 20,000 people on it, right? And you can find these forums for every make of every car. It is actually fascinating. And I really got into it. The problem was the site was buggy, the, bu the site was slow, and the, uh, the lead person who organized the whole thing was very unresponsive. So I had a lot of beef with that. So one weekend, 
when their site actually went down, I said, to hell with it, I'm going to start my own. So clubattenzo.com was born as a, as a weekend project. I started that, and I grew it to about uh, 20,000 members. And in the process, I learned quite a bit about SEO, advertising, and that whole business. So that summer, while I was doing this, I bought every book I could buy on SEO and read, and read all the material. And I quickly found out that there's actually not much behind that industry. There's lots of books. There's very little substance. And this is st we're still talking about maybe 2004. So Google is definitely the force in the market, but nobody understands how they work. And all of the old techniques are dying out. So that was an eye opener. And then the advertising world was also very interesting because uh, the way most of these sites make money is by sponsorship. So you run a big site and you walk up to a custom parts manufacturer and say, hey, I have an audience of 20,000 people here. Um, they're all car enthusiasts. Why don't you sponsor a section on this forum? I'll give you a little place for, um, for your customer representatives to answer questions, to do sales, and all that kind of stuff. But basically, we just do a value exchange there. The problem was, even though Club Atenza was big, and I was spending a lot of time on it, it was still the second site. While I was growing fast, the Mazda 6 Club was growing a lot faster. And I quickly realized that pitching um, the advertisers when you're number two was a very, very tough proposition because they were already spending a lot of money in Mazda 6 Forum. And it, it was basically, for me, it was, a, it was a losing game. So while I could make money, I couldn't make enough money to justify all the time. So that was a, an interesting insight for me, right? That being number two sucks. You have to be number one to succeed. And of course, content is king, right? Uh, one of the re uh, realizations I came to was SEO is great. Content is what matters. Yeah. So pitching advertisers sucks. And I've tried all kinds of things to get more and more traffic. In fact, at the time, uh, Google uh, did not have, nowadays, you can sign up and you get $100 credit with Google AdSense, right? So you can just drive traffic for 100 bucks. That's just free. At the time, they did not have that, but they allowed you to get a credit up to $100 without actually paying them anything. So I think technically I still own them $500 or so, but <laughs> now, now that it's, you get $100 free, I feel like I'm justified. So my next project was, I said, OK, I can't sell the advertising <coughs> on, on, this, on the site, but I have a huge audience. right? And by interacting with a lot of the people on, on that forum, I saw that some of the engineers made quite a nice living by selling custom parts. They would create their own custom parts. They would sell it uh, to the audience. And I thought, hey, I could do that too, right? Let me build a custom thing that I could I have 20,000 people on the site. I could sell them all kinds of stuff. So this was my next co-op term. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm a computer guy. I want a computer in my car. This is just when MP3 players were becoming popular, I guess, in the sense that People actually carried MP3 players with them, and it wasn't like a brick that you had to bring along. And I said, you know what? If I want a computer, I want an MP3 player, I want GPS, I want all my videos, I want Wi-Fi, I want to be able to sync with my computer from my room. I want to do all of these things, right? So let me build a custom computer. So that's what I did. A, uh, it was completely custom designed. I went to Home Depot, bought some plywood, built a box, I built a Custom computer with custom venting. I, I had to figure out the power supplies um, because you're running on 12 volts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, put lots of shiny LEDs on it just to make it look cool. Um, this was a new car, and this was a leased car. So imagine my uh, parents' horror when they found out that two weeks after I picked up the car, they walk into the garage, and the entire interior is completely and utterly gone from the car. It's all just lying in pieces. I think the only thing I didn't touch was the engine bay. Um, but even there, I had to drill holes through the, uh, through the engine bay to get my cables through. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, at the end of the day, I put 250 meters of additional cables into that car. And I know this because I had to rip them out, and that was a very painful experience when I had to return my car. So it took me quite, quite a bit of time. And I should have realized early when I was uh, doing this that this is not going to scale, right? You could see all the, <laughs> all the ways this is going wrong because the idea was I would make this and I would sell this. 
So let me just go to the next one. So six weeks later, I actually had it all up and running, right? So I had a touch screen uh, mounted on my dash. It's sitting there at the top. I had a keyboard, a lit keyboard, and I had Wi-Fi and I had everything. And the computer sat in the trunk. It was mounted. It was uh, powered by 12 volts. I had GPS. I just for fun and kicks, I completely upgraded my audio system in the process because what the hell? Um, I'm already ripping out everything from my car. I went above and beyond. I said, you know what? Windows is not going to cut it. So I took the Windows embedded version and I customized the heck out of it. I cut out absolutely every piece of software that I could. I built my own kernel for it. For it. I got the boot time down to I think it was 10 seconds, which was unheard of at the time, right? It was basically, I took an embedded OS and put it into this thing. Um, and it all worked, right? I could, I could hook up to my ECU, which is the car computer that you have, and I could tell you exactly when one of my cylinders misfired or what was my acceleration at that point in time or what was my fuel efficiency. Like, I could give you all kind. like, as a data geek, that was heaven. I, I loved it. Uh, the problem was it was completely non-scalable, right? I spent all this time customizing it, and at the end of it, I realized that there's absolutely no way I wanted to do this ever again. And even though I had people that wanted to pay, for, pay me for it, um, there was, um, out of those 20,000 people on the message board, there was um, eight people in Toronto that wanted this. They, they were ready to give me money, but I said, there's absolutely no way I'm going to do this ever again, right? Even for liability reasons. This, this is me driving my own car, I can fix stuff, but I can't even fathom thinking about doing this for other people. So it didn't make sense, but it was a fun experiment. And frankly, I was way too excited about my next project that I was going to do. So out of this thing came out the idea for tasktip.com. And this is directly related to my previous project, where I ran the Club Atenza forum. And one of the things you find there is there's lots of engineers. The people that have the most insight and the most interesting things that you could do to your car or any hobby for that matter are not the, the intersection of that with technical ability to create pretty guides or illustrations. That overlap is very, very tiny. So basically, it's in the car industry, you have a mechanic who does something interesting, right? Gets two extra horsepower because he dynoed it and he proved it, and now everybody wants to do it. The problem is you have no idea how to do it. They just say, well, you know, unbolt that and get underneath it and then, then change this part. So task tip, and I was doing this as well, right? I, as I was building a car computer, I was actually generating a lot of content for my Club Atenza site, just posting like page after page of like, this is how you do it, this is how you do it. And that was a painful experience, right? Upload a picture to Flickr, get the image link, embed it into a post form. Like, it, this is just a lot of work. So I said, you know what? I could build task tip. And the idea for TaskTip is I could make very, very easy, interactive way to help you make guides for anything, right? So you would literally go in, you create a new guide, and you say step one, and you write, write in the step. And then you click, uh, click on upload image, it would pop up a box, you upload an image, and it drops it in. And you could say, you know what, the picture actually belongs on top of this, so I'm going to drag it on top. And you could do all of that in line, you could save it, and then it would have a beautiful printable PDF copy of that as well. That, that was a key feature because I didn't have a computer when I was working on my car uh, beside me, so I wanted to have a nice printout copy, right? If you ever try to print, print something from a message board, you would quickly realize that that's just, it comes out of crap. You get 10 pages for three words of text. So also at the time, I, uh, I picked up on this Rails thing, right? It was getting hot. So I said, well, what the hell? I've been doing PHP. I've been doing all this kind of stuff, so let me just try this Rails thing. So that was my next uh, co-op work term. And I should say that I, I went through the whole co-op program. I have no idea why I paid University of Waterloo for co-op, because I, I always did my stuff. I financed it through kind of the Forte host thing that was running in the background at all times. It took me maybe you know, two, two, three hours a week of just passive work on Forte host to keep it running. But it financed all of this other experimentation. So for this term, I said, this is, this is going to be it, right? Tasktip.com. So two and a half months later of down in the basement, just writing code, I was the happiest guy ever, right? I was just 
completely into it. I would get up at 8 in the morning, I would go to sleep at 9, and I would be up at 8, and I did this for two and a half months. The problem was, by the time I got finished with it, what I realized that because I didn't know Rails or I didn't, I didn't know Ruby, to make this actually work, as in like more than one person, I would have to completely rewrite it. It just did not make sense whatsoever. I made every possible newbie mistake you could, you could do. So that made me extremely frustrated. So I said, you know what, that's it. I'm going to park it. I'm going to go another backpacking trip. <laughs> So I just parked it and I went and, and I went and did that. And that was a lot of fun. I I loved the trip. I got back and for the next term, uh, school actually took precedence because it was it was a heavy term. So I didn't really get back to it. I, I really wanted to, but I didn't have the time. And then lo and behold, one of the I think it was a Saturday morning, I am reading the news. And I see an announcement about Instructables. Are you guys familiar with Instructables? Yeah. That was a one-to-one -one in terms of features. It was exactly the same idea. And I remember that morning because I spent the, the entire, that entire day reading about uh, every single article I could find about them because they were venture funded. What the hell does that mean, venture funded? They had a team of people working on this. I always thought about my projects as fun things I do on the side. Right? It's like, who cares? Right? I'll just, maybe something good will happen out of it. But here was a company. Right? They took my idea. I thought it was my idea. And they built it. And it was financed. And they had a company around it. And they were making money, supposedly, around it. So that completely blew me away. And the lesson I learned there was ideas are a dime a dozen. Right? Anybody can have great ideas. But implementation is king. So don't worry about telling your ideas to other people. Right? Because chances are they won't build them. They, they don't know how to build them. So out of that, I realized that I, need to, I needed to learn a lot more. I needed to read a lot more. What is this VC industry they speak of? How does this financing thing work? How do they do the marketing launch? H how is it that I found out about Instructables on CNN.com? How did they get there? How could I get there, right? What was that uh, buzz marketing, one-to-one -one marketing? All of these words meant nothing to me. So I really buckled down and I bought, I basically went on a binge reading ex exercise for marketing books. I bought everything I could. I think at the time I ordered maybe 15 books from Amazon and just went through all of them. And at the end of the day, um, I think it basically just introduced me to the language. So now I could actually understand how people, well, when they talk about buzz marketing, what does it mean? How did it evolve, right? I read all the material from the early 90s, basically, to 2005. And I could see the evolution of the market. And I could understand that. I could actually, when I talked to somebody, I could actually make sense of what they were saying. So that, that really helped. And also in the process, I said, well, the problem was I didn't really know Ruby or Rails. So let me polish up on these things, right? I'm going to, for my next co-op term, I'm going to do something, something amazing. But in the meantime, I really have to learn this thing. So I, starting, I started reading more and more RSS feeds, right? And the inevitable information overload thing kicked in. I got buried. Like, I had 300 feeds. And I was trying to keep up with that while I was doing Fortehouse, while I was doing schoolwork. And that wasn't working out. So then Microsoft came out with a study. And they did a really poor job of it. They just published some um, CSV spreadsheets and, and didn't really talk about the results. So I, I, went, I went in and did, did some data mining and extracted some interesting patterns. And I realized that the study that they did was completely off the mark in the sense that the way they structured the study, they completely did not anticipate the, the actual trend. Right? They asked a series of questions about people that consume RSS. And for example, when do people read? Well, you can see that there's a spike in the evening. Makes sense. Um, you're home after dinner. You have a couple of hours. So you, you read your news kind of thing. You catch up on that. Uh, they completely missed the mark on the frequency, right? Because you can see the big spike at the end there, it just means that the graph wasn't long enough, right? They, they missed that entire interval. So people read their reader, or check their RSS readers way more than five times a day for the most part. Uh, the number of feeds, they thought everything would kind of cap out at 100. In fact, 
this graph peaks at around 175, right? So they completely missed that mark. Um, in terms of amount of time spent on uh, reading, and this is per session, right? This is not per day. So if you're reading this thing one to uh, five times a day, you're spending 30 to 60 minutes each. You're spending many hours in your RSS reader, right? So I quickly realized that this is not just me with this problem. And the problem is everybody, or everybody can associate with the problem of information overload, right? It's such a natural thing to talk about. Um, you have your email inbox, you have tons of mail, and now you have an RSS reader, which is a second inbox, and you feel extremely frustrated that that one's not getting down to zero. You can't keep up with both. So basically, people just said, forget it. I'm just not going to do the news thing, right? So around the time, I actually, I just I wrote a blog post on my blog. And I pitched the idea for PostRank. At the time, it was real, I was just frustrated. I was really frustrated with the RSS readers. The best solution at the time was keyword filtering or collaborative filtering, but it did not make sense to me because keyword filtering did not capture the actual need that I had because I didn't know what I was searching for. I would have never found out about Instructables if I did a keyword search on Google. And collaborative filtering, you need to have a community of people using RSS readers. That did not make sense either. So I pitched the idea for PostRank, and to my surprise, at the time I did have um, a few people following my blog, but somehow we got a lot of play in the community. Um, there was a, a bunch of CEOs of um, RSS companies that actually came to my blog and left comments and said, hey, this is, this is an interesting idea. This is, I could see how this could evolve. And I never really given it much thought at the time. I was like, okay, neat. So maybe somebody will do something about it. So then I promptly forgot about it. Uh, two months later, or actually a month later, I came back. And because nobody did anything, I actually said, you know what, let me try and build this. So I built the first prototype, and I published the results in my blog. You can still see it there. I even have diagrams for how, how to make this work. The only thing I didn't do was post the actual code for how I did it. I posted the results. Right? So this is the first run of the PostRank algorithm I did on my own blog. And the basic idea was, because I was publishing content, and I was in a content business, I knew how the traffic was coming to my site. Right? There's SEO and then there's social media. And at the time, social media was actually taking off. And I realized that I could judge the quality of my own content when I wrote, when I wrote a blog post by how many comments or reactions I got from the community. So intuitively, if I wrote a blog post, a blog post and I got 20 comments, and that's pretty good. Right? If I wrote, uh, wrote a blog post and nobody voted on it, nobody commented on it, nobody cared. Right? So that, that was the premise. I'm going to go out and collect all of this distributed information about how people interact with content. I'm going to use that as a signal for what's interesting and what's not. That was the core idea of PulseRank at the time. Then once again, I promptly forgot about it because you know, I proved my point. That was it. And then maybe three months later, I actually, because nobody did anything about it once again, I went back to it, right? So this idea is sitting in the public for about five months. I went back to it and said, okay, well, if I was to build an application around this, what would it look like? And I built, um, it was, once again, I remember that day clearly. It was a Saturday morning. I sat down with a coffee, and I mocked up a UI. And I guess I'm, I'm a visual person. Um, I, I got into this through web design. And it was only when I actually built the first design that it finally clicked for me. Right? I remember it being, uh, I sat down to do the design at 10. At 12, I was completely, totally wired. I, I, I was jumping all over, the, all over my room. I, th I, I knew it was something interesting. And 12 hours later, or whatever it was, 15 hours later, I, I was still sitting in you know, some remote uh, Tim Hortons location with my friends, pitching him the idea. You know, this was 3 in the morning because I was so excited about it. And out of that, ADRSS was born. So we did a lot of things right. Um, learning from task tip, right? And ha having done all that reading, and having understood some of the key drivers from Club Atenza and some of the other things, I knew that I had to do the full thing, right? So I had to incorporate the company. I had to get some money into it. I had to make it official. I had to find people that actually cared about this. And the beautiful thing about ADRSS at the time was it's very easy for people to relate to information overload. Right? So I didn't have a marketing budget. But 
I found literally hundreds of bloggers who wrote about information overload. I contacted them and I told them what, about what I was building. I invited them to do the, um, the beta. In fact, I think Mick was uh, a beta tester of our site from very early on. And we listened to the feedback and that has a very interesting effect because when you listen to people f on their feedback and you incorporate that feedback, they become invested in the product. So all of a sudden, by the time we went to launch, we had over 100 people that were invested in the product because one of their ideas was built into the uh, ADRSS site, right? And that was our marketing. When we went live, 100 people wrote about us because it just so happens that the people that consume a lot of news tend to be the people that produce news as well. It's not intuitive the first time you think about it, but it makes sense because if you're trying to produce news, you have to consume a lot of news. So most of those people had blogs. So immediately, right off the bat, we had um, 100 people writing about us. And that led to a lot of uh, prime time coverage as well. So the, the bigger sites. Um, the biggest investment we had was the, the, the actual bear um, that was made in India, Elance, right? Fast, amazing site. Uh, if you're looking for anything, I guess, copywriting to design work. So when we launched, uh, we, we really did our homework, um, built a media list, right? That's, that's where the, uh, all the reading about the marketing really helped. It was do it yourself. Uh, we didn't pay anybody a cent, uh, but we got coverage from all of these sites. And I remember the first three days after a launch very vividly because I still think about them as the most fun days, uh, not the most, but they were really, they're gonna be ingrained in my mind for a while. Because our servers went on fire, literally. Um, I did not sleep for three days, or I did sleep in like 15 minute bursts in between each one of these sites, uh, posting a story about us because they would drive a new wave of traffic and our, ser our servers would start collapsing. So we'd have to kind of bring up another one and kind of balance it out and make sure that it's all working. So we started with three servers at, uh, at the launch. And I said three because, well, I thought we really needed one, but just in case, we're going to have two, uh, two more as, as backups. And then a day later, we had 100 of them running. And frankly, that was because my code sucked, right? Like, let's be truthful about it. Uh, but that's not the point. The point was the prototype was there. It worked, and it fulfilled a need, right? That's why people came to it, and that's why they used it. So those first three days were just fun because it was, it was just fighting fires all over the place. I found all the bugs that I did not find during the beta test. And then the next three weeks were, or the next three months were kind of unglorious. Now, you know, we can't afford to pay for 100 servers, so let's work out the code, collapse all the servers, um, make all of it work, kind of really grunt uh, type of stuff. And in the process, as we were doing this, I did not think about funding at all. Right? It, was, it was just, how can we keep this up? And then it just so happened that Jackie reached out to us. We started the conversation. We talked to lots of angels. We talked to other VCs. And then out of that came out um, our first round, which was actually a couple of angels in, in Waterloo plus Tech Capital Partners. So later that year, so we launched the site in July of 07. In December, we closed our round uh, with Tech Capital. And uh, then we went on to uh, become post-rank. So we started as ADRSS, but just through feedback from our community, the name really didn't click. So we, uh, we migra migrated to postrank.com. And the basic idea behind post-rank is still the same, right? If you look back, um, let's say Google, right? The key insight in Google in 1997 was Larry and Sergey said, links matter. Right? Instead of just looking at text, we could look at pages. So if you write a page and I write a page and I link to yours, that's me giving you a vote of confidence for your page. So let's, let's, uh, let's use that, right? And that's a diagram at the top. Let's use the link graph. In 2007, when we came about with PostRank, the key insight was the web has fundamentally changed in the, in the sense that we do things with content now. Not only do we post pages and link to other pages, we're also sharing content in the sense that I can go on Facebook and say, hey, John, check out this link, right? So I've just, I've sent you a message, but it contains a link. Twitter is another example. Dig.com, you can actually vote on stories. You can leave comments. Reddit, um, dozens and dozens of these social services are 
um, spraying up all over the place in all kinds of niches. And each one of those interactions is a vote of confidence. Right? So we could build a service that aggregates all of that activity. That's like leaving a link to, to that story. So if we could aggregate that in real time, we could have a really interesting insight into what's hot, what's working, and what's not. And so that's, uh, that's what we did. We built PulseRank.com, which is a, um, this is a free consumer app. You can come to PulseRank. You can type in any feed you want. You can customize your RSS. So you could filter it by keyword. So for example, if I came to TechCrunch.com, I could look for iPhone stories that have a lot of engagement. And I could subscribe to that. Right? And that same technology we use to power um, a number of applications. So at age 150, which is a marketing site, um, just recently we launched um, Atlantic 50, which is the, uh, if you're familiar with the, the Atlantic, the magazine, they launched the uh, 50 most influential uh, political bloggers and influencers. They're using, using PulseRank to measure that. And in terms of kind of high level things, what we do now, uh, we aggregate over 50 million events every day. We archive all that data uh, in terms of engagement. We have two years of that data, so, which gives us really interesting data mining um, capabilities. So one interesting insight that we discovered was um, recently, 80% of all of the activity around content, let's say you wrote a story, 80% of all the activity around your story today happens off your property. So if I wrote a blog post and I got 20 comments on it, chances are you've missed the other 40 to 60 events that are happening elsewhere. And that's Twitter, that's Facebook, that's all of these networks. And as a publisher, that's very important because social media is the, in the top three of your traffic drivers. And people don't know how to interact with social media. Right? So when you look at a story and how the page use for a story happened, you'll see that in the first hour, about 50% of all the engagement, as in all the pages, happened in that first hour. And that's driven purely by social media. And that's what we measure. And then the other 50% is SEO. That's Google's territory, right? That's the well understood market, but nobody understands that first hour. And that's where we, we're really well positioned to do. So that's our data mining and real time APIs. So now I just wanted to do a quick quiz, right? So the theme behind this was. There's no, no one particular thing that led me to PulseRank to say, aha, this is, this is it. Um, it was really a number of things in the process that I just tried and failed at, and eventually it led to this. And coming back to the, how did the other people do it, right? That's, that's what really interests me. How do other founders find their ideas? How do they get to it? Guess the name of the company. And in fact, they started as a what company? They evolved into a shoe manufacturer and then went on to dominate the consumer electronics market. How about this one? Yeah, that's Nintendo. Twitter. Friendster. Friendster was, of course, came before Facebook, right? And Facebook took over that entire market. But Friendster's initial idea was to be a dating site. And the insight, the, the core idea was, we're going to connect you with your friends, and they're going to refer you to other people you should know, because that's the way it works in the real world, right? Like it, it's, if you look at the actual dating market, most people meet their spouse through a friend. So they said, well, that's what Friendster is. Francis for. So PayPal. <laughs> yep, so that's PayPal. Uh, Max Lepchin started the company on the premise of building secure crypto to do transfers of money through your uh, Palm Pilots. Of course later they became PayPal and eBay bought them for some obscene amount of money in the billions of dollars. So my key message is experiment, build stuff, try stuff. 
Um, there's absolutely no stigma in failing. In fact, if you're not failing at something, it means you're not pushing hard enough, right? So what I like to hear and what I like to learn about from other founders is all the other things that they did before they got to the idea. That's what really tells you about um, how that idea came to be and how they got there in the first place. It is very rare that you'll find somebody with a, that initial idea that completely took off and now they're famous for it, right? Um, Jeff Bezos tried a lot of different things before he stumbled across Amazon. Same thing for any other founder that you'll, that you'll find. So that's what I have. So if you guys have any questions, happy to. So, so what was the question initial? So basically, your goal is to help people find RSS feeds, right? Th that was certainly the, one of the first things that we focused on. Our initial, uh, the initial thing we, try, we tried to solve was the question of, you have 500 feeds, you have 15 minutes, how do you go about getting that, the best content out of that pile? Right? We really tried to nail that use case down. We have thousands of articles. Instead of having a pile of stuff that you just randomly pick away from, can we give you them an order of usefulness to you? So that, that's what postrank.com was. That's how we started. And did we have a business plan for how we're going to monetize at the time? We thought we had an idea. At the, at the time, um, behavioral advertising was the hot thing, right? A Quantive was bought, Bluefish was bought, Amazon, like there was a consolidation in the market and lots of people were talking about behavioral advertising. And we really thought we could do something in that space because we were intimate with people that were using our feeds. We could tell what they were subscribing to, what they were reading, all that kind of stuff. In the long run, it proved to be, it didn't work out at all, right? So we've evolved since then. So now we offer data services to companies that want to consume the content from the blogosphere or the, the media as a whole. Um, we sell that. We, uh, we work with media companies and brand monitoring kind of applications. Um, we have an analytics product for publishers coming out in the next week, actually. So it's, kind of, it's all building on that data that we have. So I went through the core program. I, I paid the money. I actually interviewed for a couple of companies, but never, never went through with um, any of those positions. Um, I think it did help um, in the sense that it got me, uh, it got me talking to other people about. It, but if I was to do it again, I probably wouldn't pay the core program all that money because I didn't really use the system. But it came down to, I don't know, I, I always tried to do my own things, right? I kind of stumbled into it. It seems like velocity is... Yeah, I wish, I wish velocity was here, right, when, when I was going through this program. Uh, the number one uh, thing that I don't like about the core program is because is, is the fact that it gets you into that thinking mode of I got to get my resume in the moment you get into the door, right? You, you arrive on campus and two weeks you got to get the resume, you got to get the, you know, is it Amazon? They're like, oh, did you get an interview with Microsoft, like Google, right? That's not the point, right? Um, but all of my friends were into that and I kind of watched it from the sidelines and I was annoyed about it, frankly. Uh, this summer, uh, Google Reader added a lot of like social networking features that sort of must have you kind of concerned because they seem to compete with what you're doing. Like, how do you feel about the kind of direction they're taking? That um, so we're not concerned about it at all. Um, in fact, it's yet another data source for us, right? So our 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 core competency is the fact that we collect all of this data. So the more of it is available, the better. Um, when we first started. Um, the whole idea of we're going to use external engagement data to rank content was a bit of a, a wild card, right? It was, it, it was not clear to most people that that was an, a useful thing to do. Um, it's funny to think about it, but two years ago, most newspapers did not have comment sections on their sites, 
right? It was seen as like we couldn't do that. We couldn't fathom doing that. Uh, Twitter was more or less an unknown entity. Dig was really kind of becoming to be a, a mainstream type thing, but it was still very much a tech oriented site. So most people never, th they didn't think about social media as a, as a general purpose tool. And really the big question for us was, if we build this engine, is it going to be useful outside of the tech industry? Right? Like it's great that we can tell you the hot articles for the tech geeks, but what about the mommy bloggers or the, you know, the moms of the world? And now it's completely in reverse, right? Every newspaper has comments. People are sharing stuff all over the world. You know, Twitter is on uh, Oprah. And we see that all those things as great things for a company because they're validating the market for us. We don't have to justify our existence. People get it. And because of that, we have much more interesting conversations with lots of people. We're helping them measure this thing, right? Because now the question is, now that it's happened and everybody has accepted the fact that social media is not going away, it hasn't changed the world, it hasn't changed marketing, but it's, it's a piece that you can't disregard anymore. How do you measure that? What is the return on investment of Twitter? Like, I ha we, we have a community manager, so does Ali, right? He has a community manager that um, answers questions on Facebook, on Twitter. How do you measure that? What is the return on investment? That's a really tough problem, and that's what we're trying to help with. Sure. So it's, it's similar. Um, so what I did is, you know how you have these four strand widgets? Yep. You can incorporate in your WordPress blog or whatever blog. Uh, you, all you have to do is give it an RSS feed. So, um, so say I write like 100 posts over a matter of, say, two or three years. And, uh, you know, there's one, there's like five posts that are really good. And I look at what's good about these posts and I try to copy them or I try to like mesh what's good and try to write better and better posts. So this one day I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna write a really good post today that I want, uh, I want it to be better than the, the, what is currently the best. Yeah. But the problem is the posts that other people are seeing are always the top five or the top six. So even though this new post is, I think personally, way better than the best, it never actually can climb up because it climbs up a little bit. But then since people aren't seeing this frequently, right. it, it's really hard for it to be the top, come to the top five. Right. So what about these kind of posts? Yeah, so that, that's a really, um, I think if you were to expand that question, it comes down to serendipity, right? So how do you introduce people to new things? This is the number one complaint against recommendations engines. Uh, th there's a question of do they just lead, lead us to become more and more narrow because hey you subscribe to 10 VC related feeds here's another 20 so you have just focused on that topic you're not really looking outside it's the same problem um, we've we've intentionally stayed away from making qualitative decisions about content on our side right we don't want to say here's a really good blog post because we think so in fact, we've tried to be as transparent as possible about how we rank content. We say, here's what the community thinks about your content. And we've built some mechanisms into, for example, the, the widget that we have, right? Uh, we actually consider a certain period of time. We don't look your, at your entire history. We look at the last, depending on your frequency of posts, we look at your last, let's say, three months. And we feature the top content from the three months. Um, but that's a really interesting challenge in general. Uh, we don't specifically uh, have a solution for it or we concern ourselves with it but there's plenty of companies especially kind of the news aggregator space that are trying to tackle that problem how do you find the interesting things right Facebook is a great example of what are your friends looking at now right there's a whole slew of apps that could be built around your social networks to help you surface that information and serendipity Twitter's kind of working for that but kind of not right I like when I have a stream of updates hundreds every hour, I don't read all of that. Maybe I miss something interesting. So there's, I think there's a lot of potential in that space. And we see PostRank as a tool to help you get there, but not necessarily, we're not building consumer apps. PostRank.com is a demo of our technology more so than anything. Thank you. All right. Is that a nice little folder for you? Thank you. And just for, there's, some donuts out there. Uh, David Craig, I believe, starts at around 2.30. Um, and we'll be in the other room for that. Uh, and I'm sure it really is available yep. for any questions. And yeah, emails, I, asset facts. I should have. I don't have my email here, but it's ilya at postrank.com.
So feel free to ping me there too.